what frequency are we going to use and what grade of ground station are we going to use? Well, actually quite excited about this because the ground station turns out to not be an issue. I don't know if any of you have heard of Tiny GS. So as a quick introduction, Tiny GS is actually a community of um, ham radio operators as well as just general enthusiasts that is currently able to deploy their own gateways and actually track live satellites. So what we're looking at here is the Tiny GS website. I'll put the link in the description below as well as the Telegram uh, group as to where the discussions as to how to get set up and what to do from there on forward. And as you can see here, this is the map of all the current ground stations that's already been deployed using the LoRa network. Now, most of these devices are deployed in the 400 megahertz range um, for performance reasons. It's the only frequency that without additional hardware can communicate from um, LEO or low Earth orbit to these little ground stations from all these people. And if you click through the stations, you can see where all the stations are based. You can see all the names of the stations. You can contact the person that owns the station. And you can also see the amount of telemetry packets that's been received from these gateways and when they were last received and from what satellite. If we go through the actual satellites, the little CubeSats that's currently in orbit, you can see which ones are live at what frequency and which ones are inactive. In other words, they've either reached end of life or something went wrong during a launch or something to that effect. But you can see how big this community actually is. And that is the reason for us picking LoRa. That is the reason for us picking 433 megahertz because we don't have to worry about any of the ground station as to what we normally would if we went the proprietary route in terms of an actual um, custom designed radio and all the difficulties associated with that. I think picking a CubeSat as a um, DIY project is <laughs> hard enough as it is. So I don't think we need to make it even more challenging for us to throw building a ground station into the equipment as well. Please click on the link, please join the network. Um, the more gateways there is up, the, the higher chances there are of actually helping somebody receive packets from the actual little CubeSat in space. So this is a dipole antenna, but when it's loose like this, it can actually be referred to as a monopole antenna. And not to get it too deep into the antenna theory, but basically a monopole antenna is a antenna that sits horizontally above the ground plane. So if that's your antenna, it has a ground plane. But in reality, that's not how most of these devices end up being. In most devices, this gets installed on a device and effectively becomes a dipole antenna, but not a very good one. So we'll quickly discuss the workings of a proper dipole antenna, why this is a bad antenna, and then why a dipole antenna is actually the right choice. A dipole antenna is two quarter wave elements stuck together to make half the wavelength of a frequency. Let's quickly look at what a dipole antenna is and why it's the right choice for us and why this is a bad antenna. For our purposes, our frequency of interest is 403 all the way to 435 megahertz. This is for good reasons. This is obviously for the tiny GS community as well as the gateway that we are about to build. So we need to build an antenna for our CubeSat or evaluate antennas for our CubeSat that is in this frequency range. And the easiest way to do that is to build either a quarter wave ground plane antenna or a half wavelength dipole antenna. In a nutshell, if you look at a, a frequency wavelength, it looks like something like that. And a full wavelength is basically from peak to peak or valley to valley, whichever way you look at it. So from there to there is one full wavelength. And a wavelength is generally indicated by lambda. So a half wavelength antenna actually spans half of this frequency. So if we have an axis through here, this would be half a wavelength. And our antenna is to be designed to reflect this um, distance. And this distance changes for every single frequency. If you go lower, this length goes longer. If you go up, the length goes shorter and vice versa. So let's quickly look at an actual dipole antenna.
that is a lightweight homemade dipole antenna. And right now, both of these, what we call elements, is close to 180 millimeters in length. What you, or the way you can look at this antenna is, is two quarter waves. Although that forms part of the antenna, I'm just drawing it out so it's clear to you that these are both equal lengths. And both of these um, sections together forms what we just discussed in terms of that little half bridge. If that is a full wavelength, whether you look at it from that angle or from this angle, it's both the same distance. Just doing a bad job of drawing it. And we said that our half wavelength is supposed to represent this. That section that is there for a 400 and I think 5 megahertz equals to 180 millimeters on either side of the actual dipole antenna. And this hasn't been tuned yet or cut yet. We will do that momentarily. But effectively what's going to happen is, is this will actually be cut slightly shorter due to something called the velocity factor. And that's just basically how quickly the, the signal travels through the actual material that you have. And that number becomes very important because for the purposes of our CubeSat, we need to test different materials. Copper, generally, depending on the quality of the copper, it's got a velocity factor of anywhere from 98 to 95 percent of the um, intended wavelength. So let's say, for instance, the theoretical calculation said there was 200 millimeters. Well, in reality, using um, pure copper, you probably cut 2 percent off of that to get to the actual wavelength. Now, there's other considerations like the um, losses through here or the extra inductance that is seen through the system so you might actually end up cutting it even slightly shorter to get to the right impedance at the right frequency but the important thing is this is a dipole antenna and the way a dipole antenna works effectively is it forms its own ground plane so for an antenna on this side to radiate properly it needs to reflect off of something and that's something generally a ground plane so if you look at this antenna the way it is here, that actual element is connected to ground and this one is connected to the center core. And when the ground plane matches the radiating element um, 100%, the radiating element is at its most efficient design or at its most efficient peak to radiate all the power that is put into the antenna. And vice versa, it is also the best for reception when it comes back when you, or something when something is transmitted to the device itself. So if you look at this antenna, the reason why it's a bad antenna is, is because they effectively built this antenna to be one half of a dipole. And they just hope that when you buy this antenna and actually screw it onto your Wi-Fi router or onto your radio or onto anything, that the other half of the system, whatever it is, forms the other part of the antenna. Now, I've seen this work brilliantly I've also seen it work horribly um, because ironically most people buy these sort of things as an external antenna for a IoT node for instance or a IoT Internet of Things device but the Internet of Things device is this big because the aim of that design is always to make the device as small as possible and they think that they're going to get extra range by plonking this antenna on top but the rest of the ground plane is not it's not there like you can't make up a ground plane out of out of thin air essentially so oftentimes or not a well-tuned internal antenna that's got its own properly sized ground plane performs better than one of these antennas do moving on to the next part of this video we will we'll actually be putting this on the vna vector network analyzer to see the performance um, and the reason why we need to do this is because we need a baseline for what our next provisions of these antennas will look like um, in terms of performance so, and so connecting the antenna to a vector network analyzer allows us to see at what frequency our antenna is sensitive at and to what uh, level or what magnitude. So you can see it's roughly below minus 20 or 24 thereabouts. And this gives us a good baseline as to where the antenna is sensitive and to what magnitude. So now we have something to reference against. And so now that we tested the actual performance of a quote-unquote ideal antenna for the frequency band that we are interested in, we can discuss why this won't work for our CubeSat light. So 
when you have a cube satellite like this, and this is a one to one replica of an actual CubeSat, um, when this is inside the what they call the B pod, basically the antenna system cannot protrude from this device until deployed. So you need to look at some sort of antenna releasing mechanism that deploys the antenna after the device ejects from the, the P-Pod and copper is not a very good material for that. So what's the alternatives? Well, you would have seen if you've done a bit of research into CubeSats that they all have a tape measure stuck on top and that's actually the antenna. What they are doing is they're taking the advantage of the property and the memory of this material to spring back into place once released. And so what they do is they would wrap this as a dipole around the actual device. And once released, there's a special release burn mechanism, which is the next episode. And that's why we have to discuss this. But basically they do this and then in space, they release the antenna and therefore they get their ideal dipole antenna without the need to have it fixed at the time of launch. And if you've done a bit of research on this, everybody will tell you that a tape measure doesn't actually make a very good antenna. With that in mind, I started thinking as to what could be alternatives to that solution. And two things came to mind. One is a different type of antenna to have something like a directional antenna. And what that means is if you have your little CubeSat in space, and Earth is here. If you could somehow make sure that your device is always pointing towards Earth, then you could use something called a ceramic patch antenna, which is a little antenna that allows you to only transmit and receive in an area of interest. And so you could point that to Earth and make sure that you're always sensitive towards that. The problem is it makes your device's attitude towards Earth, and that means how it's faced in, in orbit, a lot more difficult. And it means you have to always track where Earth is around all of this. With a ideal dipole antenna, it's an omnidirectional antenna, so you don't have to worry about that. So using a patch antenna like this makes the CubeSat design and the control mechanism a lot more complicated than what it ought or need to be, especially at the level we're playing at. So that's why directional antennas is not a good idea for this type of application. Coming back to this, I thought, what about steel cable? Because you can cut steel cable to the same sort of length, and we will just show you the results of that just now in terms of where its performance lies as compared against the ideal antenna. But it's got the added benefit of actually being able to be wrapped up into a fairly small space. And with the burn mechanism released, the actual bend of the device like this might have an impact on the performance of the antenna, and that's why we're going to test it next. I think this might be an ideal material for what we want to do, performance depending. The problem with a lot of these materials is actually um, the duration in which they are coiled up in. The entire duration from when you've built your CubeSat to when it actually gets launched the device can sit in a coiled form for quite a few months. And so if you have a device that actually has a bit of memory at the time when it's finally launched, it might only like release back to like that or not even properly release out of the mechanism at all. So you need something with a high reliability that can stay coiled up for a long period of time and still deploy when required. And that's the reason for trying to find an alternative material that is lighter weight, better performance than a tape measure. And so we get cutting and I found a Dremel actually works best for cutting the steel wire. Not that it was the safest way of doing it, but it got the job done. Just had to end off with a bit of the sharp bits with a rotary bit and then we were on to soldering. A lot of swearing and a lot of burned fingers, but there's no other way of doing this. And so we have an antenna that is now made up out of the actual uh, braided steel wire. And what's interesting was when it was first installed, I got this effect whereby the antenna would actually droop.
and what I found quite useful is actually the fact that if you look closely you'll see little solder dots along the way and what that allowed me to do is bend the cable in the orientation I wanted, put a bit of um, solder into it and that would actually tension the antenna to stay sh fairly straight in terms of uh, what we require but still allow me enough flexibility to roll it up or de or deploy it after we've um, launched the satellite. Here we have it. So what we've taken is actually the original antenna and we've replaced the elements with our braided steel wire and through painstaking um, tuning tuned it to a point where I think the performance is actually comparable and I'll put the charts up right now and as you can see this is the original chart in terms of um, where the antenna is the most sensitive now for the viewers that's non-technical just a quick brief basically where the the graph dips at its lowest point you want your center frequency or your frequency of interest to be in that dip so you can notice on the axis is that it dips to below 20 or more than 20 for the, the ideal dipole and you can also see where it dips to for this current um, dipole is to the, the unit on the test. So you can see they're very close in terms of the performance ratios and I think I'll call that a win because right now what I've been able to do is replace the existing wire with a braided wire. I've been able to manipulate this wire into any sort of form that I would require for our little CubeSat and I'm, I'm quite chuffed with that. And so in conclusion, the reason why we did this exercise is actually for the next video. And what the next video is about is what they call the antenna release circuitry or uh, the burn circuitry. I'll put a little clip here as a teaser as to what's up and coming. But effectively what that means is when the CubeSat is actually released into space, the antenna is in a folded position like we discussed. And you need a very special circuitry that allows that antenna to be released. Now, the challenge we face is because we are trying to actually design a very low cost, cheap solution, um, we need to find a method that's reliable to actually deploy and release our little antenna the way we would like it to. But there are some certain constraints that's been put in place by the CubeSat specification that doesn't allow us to use the conventional methods like pyrotechnics or anything like that. This is, doesn't really stop us from testing it, but we have to get a baseline as to what is the best way forward, how the industry does it, and then ultimately we'll come up with our own little system, our test our own little system as to how to deploy our antenna on our CubeSat light. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see a bit more technical stuff, a bit more hands-on work, um, love to hear from you. Please comment. Consider subscribing if you like this sort of content or if you found any value in it. Until next time, thank you for watching.